I'd like to wish everyone a good afternoon uh, and good morning, depending on where you are today. Welcome to today's webinar on the topic of tobacco regulation in a changing policy landscape. This is the third of our new webinar series, which is a collaboration of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network and our Smoke-Free Environments Law Project and the Center for the Assessment of Tobacco Regulations, or CASTOR, which is a uh, partnership of the University of Michigan and Georgetown University. The Smoke-Free Environments Law Project is supported by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and its tobacco program. And CASTOR is supported by the National Institutes of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. I'm Cliff Douglas, and I serve as the director of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network and the Smoke-Free Environments Law Project, and am also an adjunct professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, as well as a co-investigator with CASTOR. And as you know, I'm joined by Kara Kiesling, who serves as the manager uh, of the Smoke-Free Environments Law Project and is a wonderful doctoral student at our School of Public Health. I'll leave the main introduction of our topics to our two fine speakers, Holly Jarman and Micah Berman, but we'll just start by noting that given recent events in this area, this discussion could not be any timelier. Indeed, we're grateful for the very substantial turnout that we expect uh, based on the registration for this webinar and thank all of you for being here. For our colleagues who cannot be here due to the Veterans Day holiday or for other reasons, and for those of you who may like to revisit this discussion again later, the webinar is being recorded and will be, be disseminated on the website of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network and on YouTube. And we will also, of course, provide a link on Twitter. In the news these days are headline level issues, surrounding the FDA's pre-market tobacco product application process, the PMTA process, the burgeoning market for synthetic nicotine containing vaping products, debates over the use of menthol and other flavors and a variety of tobacco and nicotine products. And of course, uh, currently the rapidly shifting landscape on Capitol Hill regarding the details of proposed tobacco product tax increases in the pending Build Back Better plan. We may or may not be able to cover all of these issues given time constraints, but I know that we will have the benefit of an enlightening discussion of a range of these issues with application to both domestic considerations and also considerations overseas, including the United Kingdom. And this will be further enhanced by your questions during the latter part of the webinar. So I want to thank both of our speakers for sharing their time, knowledge, and insights with us, and I will now introduce them. First will be Micah Berman, an attorney who holds a joint appointment with The Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law, and OSU's College of Public Health. His scholarship examines the intersection between public health research and legal doctrine with a focus on tobacco policy. He has published articles in a number of journals, such as the American Journal of Law and Medicine, the Brooklyn Law Review, and the American Journal of Public Health. Prior to joining Ohio State, Professor Berman was a member of the faculty at the New England Law School in Boston, where he established and directed the Center for Public Health and Tobacco Policy. He has also served as an advisor to the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Tobacco Products and as a member of the National Institutes of Health's Council of Public Representatives. Next, Holly Jarman is the John G. Searle Assistant Professor in the Department of Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. A political scientist, Professor Jarman researches the impact of trade agreements and economic regulations on domestic health and social policies with a focus on the United States and the European Union. Her work has been published in such journals as The Lancet, Government and Opposition, the European Journal of Public Health, the Journal of Public Health Policy, Tobacco Control, and Public Policy and Administration. Her monograph, The Politics of Trade and Tobacco Control, explores the consequences of trade law for tobacco control policies. 
Professor Jarman received her PhD and Master of Research degrees in political science from the London School of Economics and Political Science. So again, we will start by hearing from our speakers and we will then entertain your questions. So it's my pleasure now to hand it over to you, Micah. Please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cliff, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I see the number keeps keeps going up. Uh, so glad everyone is able to join us uh, on this, this Veterans Day. Um, I hope I'm not offending too many people with my Ohio State background and, and slides. Uh, for those of you people in, in Michigan, since, since there's nobody here today in the office, I can disclose that I was actually born in Michigan, um, in, in Kalamazoo, um, and lived there for the first few years of my life before moving, moving down here. Um, I'm going to talk somewhat narrowly about synthetic nicotine, which is, is one of those rapidly developing topics. Uh, and then you know, hopefully we can have time for a discussion and, and talk more generally about FDA regulation or, or other topics that people um, want to talk about. Uh, first, just wanted to, to uh, in terms of disclosures and thanks, uh, some of my work on synthetic nicotine has been funded um, by the World Health Organization, which is interested in this issue uh, internationally. And then I've been working on various aspects of, of this issue with all of these wonderful people um, noted here. Um, also just wanted to thank Cliff um, and also the Truth Initiative for um, tracking this issue and, and sending me <laughs> updates uh, as the news develops uh, pretty, pretty quickly. So um, yeah, I'll get to what synthetic nicotine is in a minute, but uh, as Cliff said, this is a really timely uh, topic. Uh, developing pretty rapidly. Uh, as, as probably most of the people on this call know, the FDA is now belatedly requiring uh, e-cigarette companies to go through the pre-market tobacco application review process, the PMTA process. This is sort of an after the fact uh, pre-market review. It's not really pre-market since they've been on the market for, for quite some time. But the FDA has to uh, go through all of these applications, millions of these applications, and decide whether or not allowing these products to stay on the market would be appropriate for the protection of, of public health. Um, most of the decisions, almost all of the decisions that the FDA has issued so far has been have been negative, uh, denying marketing authorizations for these products. The only positive um, decisions it has made has been for three, three different uh, applications related to RJ Reynolds's Muse uh, products. So that, that's it. Everything else so far has been told it has to be taken off the market, but there are still a lot of other products that are out there pending where the FDA has not uh, issued decisions yet. So we've started to see articles like this, uh, one from Filter Magazine, one from Time, um, both of them discussing the same company uh, called uh, Vapor Salon based in Texas, which as soon as the FDA rejected its PMTAs, the company made an announcement that it was going to switch to using synthetic nicotine instead of tobacco drive nicotine and stay on the market uh, instead of, of pulling its products off. Uh, so uh, these two articles were about the same company, but th there is a, a clear expectation that they are not gonna be the only company, that there are gonna be lots of other companies that are, are likely to do the same thing uh, in response to the FDA's action. And I should say either do the same thing or at least claim that they're doing the same thing. It's also possible we could see companies claiming to switch to synthetic nicotine uh, without actually doing it. So I think that's that's one thing to, to keep an eye on. Uh, the reason these companies are doing that is because the FDA cannot regulate synthetic nicotine uh, as a tobacco product. Uh, it is limited by statute, by the Tobacco Control Act, to regulating products that are, quote, made or derived from tobacco, uh, end quote. So uh, the idea by these companies is that if they can switch to synthetic nicotine, they can avoid FDA regulation. So you know, the, the first company to do this was actually Puff Bar, um, which sells flavored disposable e-cigarettes that have proven to be quite popular with kids. Uh, it was uh, essentially pushed off of the market by, by uh, FDA 
guidance and warnings. Uh, it then returned to the market uh, earlier um, earlier this year, uh, claiming that it was now switching to synthetic nicotine. Uh, and then, you know, as far as I'm aware of, it did not even file PMTAs. It just said we are exempt from FDA tobacco regulation because we are using synthetic. Uh, nicotine. So that's that's the landscape we're in right now. The fact that companies would would try to do this and get around FDA regulation um, was quite predictable. Uh, in fact, we predicted it. Uh, Patty Zettler and, and Natalie Hemrick and I wrote an article in 2018 predicting that companies would start doing exactly this when the FDA started doing its its PMTA review, uh, and now they are are actually doing it. Um, other news is that Congress is paying attention to this. This is uh, just from earlier this week. Uh, Representative uh, Krishnamurthy uh, sent letters to Puff Bar uh, and to another company uh, asking for information. Uh, that's often a prelude to holding a public hearing uh, on, on this topic. So it's something that at least some members of Congress are, are paying attention to. So let me just back up from there and then talk about nicotine uh, and synthetic nicotine. So nicotine, uh, as again, probably everyone on this call knows, uh, is an alkaloid that is naturally present in tobacco plants. Its addictive properties are very well known as people on this call have probably heard Cliff and others discuss. Uh, nicotine is, is what makes tobacco products addictive, but it is not what makes them deadly. So you know, in theory, at least, and this is the theory behind e-cigarettes, uh, if you can replace cigarette smoking with a less harmful delivery mechanism for nicotine, uh, there could be tremendous public health gains uh, from that. So all of that is pretty well known. Uh, what's less known is that nicotine actually exists in two different forms. Uh, there's the S form of nicotine and the R form of nicotine. And they have the same chemical structure, but slightly different spatial arrangement. So the only difference is the direction of the hydrogen atom, where you can see the, the star is noted uh, on, on these figures. Um, in the tobacco plant itself, the vast majority of the nicotine is in the S form. So what, what has been extensively studied is the S form of nicotine. The R form has been far less studied, in fact, not very well studied at all, uh, but seems to be uh, far less biologically active. Uh, so it, it may well be that it is largely inert and really doesn't do much of anything um, biologically, but it, is the case with some other molecules that, that the chiral form, the sort of spatially flipped form of it, uh, does have some unintended negative health effects. So it's we shouldn't necessarily assume um, that there, there is nothing to be concerned about. I think it, it's, as I said, surprisingly little research has been done uh, on the R form of nicotine. I am, you know, the reason that this is important is because the R form shows up in synthetic nicotine. So, you know, until recently, nicotine used in commercial products was exclusively sourced from tobacco plants. So cigarette companies figured out a long time ago how to extract the nicotine from tobacco plants and have used it for decades to adjust nicotine levels and all sorts of products. But all of that nicotine has been derived from the tobacco products uh, themselves. Synthesizing nicotine um, is something that has been feasible for a long time, uh, but until very recently, it has been considered far too expensive to be used uh, commercially, but that seems to be changing now. There are new, new mechanisms being developed, it's being used at scale, and the price is coming down uh, extremely rapidly. So, when you derive nicotine synthetically in a lab, uh, all of the methods out there produce a racemic mis mixture of R nicotine and S nicotine, which means it's, it's equal parts R nicotine and S nicotine. Um, and you know, there are different methods for doing that synthesizing. Uh, little is known right now about the byproducts that might be formed uh, during that production. So that's another area where I think more research is needed. 
Um, and then there are several recently patented methods that allow for the isolation of the S nicotine. So you know, every process that's out there produces this mixture, but some companies have figured out how to do a second step, which gets you to just the S nicotine, which then gets you to nicotine that very much looks like nicotine that is derived from, from tobacco. And you know, is chemically, at least the nicotine part is, is identical um, to uh, the nicotine that is derived from tobacco products themselves. So here's a just quick comparison. Tobacco derived nicotine is, is predominantly in the S form. Uh, it contains natural impurities typically, although methods are also being improved to eliminate some of those natural impurities. On the synthetic side, you have you know, this, this mixture, but, but it can be you know, further processed from there to uh, more similarly, more similarly uh, approach what the tobacco derived version looks like. Uh, it may have varying levels of byproducts. Uh, and you know its price is still more, uh, but the price, as I said, is coming down um, pretty quickly. Uh, who is producing this? These synthetic nicotine products? Um, it is not the the major tobacco companies that are producing synthetic nicotine. Uh, it is you know, wholesale nicotine companies uh, that are producing it and then selling it to to other companies to put it into actual products. Uh, in the U.S., the main supplier seems to be Next Generation Labs, which is actually the other company that Congressman Krishnamurthy sent a letter to. Um, and uh, what they are producing is they've branded it TFN nicotine. Uh, that is a racemic mixture. So it's 50% R and 50% X, 50% S. Uh, it is sent to different companies that then use it in you know, for e-liquids or uh, in pouches or in other types of, of products. Uh, CNT is a major international supplier of, of tobacco-derived nicotine, but it has now also gotten into the synthetic nicotine uh, market. And CNT is one of the companies that, that has figured out how to do that extra step. So, you know, they are selling the isolated S nicotine and, you know, they're making the argument uh, that that is better and that is what companies should be using uh, as opposed to what what Next Generation Labs is selling. Uh, so as I said, companies downstream are then taking the synthetic nicotine and putting it into various products. Uh, we're seeing synthetic nicotine in, in e-cigarettes of all sorts, uh, in nicotine pouches. There's a heat not burn product that is about to come to the market if it hasn't already uh, using synthetic nicotine. Um, I just saw nicotine toothpicks uh, using synthetic nicotine. So, you know, all sorts of alternative products uh, are uh, at least claiming to be using uh, synthetic nicotine. And you can see here, they're also making claims that there are benefits to using synthetic nicotine as opposed to tobacco derived nicotine. So a lot of the marketing focuses on the impurities that might be found with tobacco derived nicotine and says, you know, is you know, essentially making at least an implicit health claim that the synthetic version is, is cleaner and safer. I like the one in the middle that says it's as clean as our Nordic air. Um, but you know, different, um, you know, different types of, of claims that are going, you know, a pharmaceutical grade is another kind of implicit health, health claim there. Um, so you know, claims that, that there is some benefit here to using um, synthetic nicotine. So this is not, you know, other types of products, sometimes the, the synthetic version is seen as, as you know, less than the original. Uh, here, the companies are, are arguing that the synthetic version is, is better than uh, the original in some way. So um, this is just some examples of it showing up on various websites. Uh, this is not something companies are hiding. It is something that the companies are actually proud of, that they are using the synthetic nicotine and they're arguing that there are benefits uh, to doing that. So where this all gets interesting, at least to me, is on the regulatory side. Uh, so this is the article that uh, my colleagues and I wrote in 2018 that was published in the Boston College Law Review, where we, we noted this potentially problematic regulatory gap. Um, so, you know, again, the, the Tobacco Control Act only allows for the regulation of products under the tobacco regula regulatory authority that are made and derived from tobacco. Um, 
as a result of court cases that were quite a while ago now, um, e-cigarettes that are at least marketed for recreational use uh, fall within that tobacco regulatory scheme as long as they are using tobacco derived nicotine. Uh, but uh, that, that definition would seem to exclude products that, that use synthetic nicotine. The FDA has been uh, somewhat reticent to say that out loud. Um, they, they sort of imply that it is a gray area, uh, but you know, I, I think it's, it's pretty clear uh, that if the product is actually uh, made from synthetic nicotine and there is no, no tobacco derived uh, products, uh, or no tobacco derived pieces uh, that are being used with it, uh, that, then it is likely outside, uh, I think it is outside, uh, the FDA's tobacco regulatory authority. So, um, this was not such a big deal when e-cigarettes were not really being regulated by the FDA. Uh, but now that, that this PMDA process is happening and companies are being, are, are being told to stop selling their e-cigarette products, um, it is um, becoming uh, more of a big deal. And as I said, the companies are, are now starting to switch over uh, and claim that they are outside of the FDA's reach. Uh, this was something Cliff sent me just a week or so ago, um, quoting Mitch Zeller at the FDA, um, saying that the FDA is well aware of this issue and sees it as a concern. Uh, and interestingly, also notes at the very end here that the FDA is talking to Congress about a potential legislative uh, fix for it. Um, it's not just FDA regulation that could be impacted. It could also be all sorts of other uh, tobacco related regulations at the federal, state and local level. Um, so this was from an industry analyst publication back in May, um, talking about uh, companies promoting synthetic products at, a, at an industry expo. Uh, and then this analyst says here that tobacco-free nicotine, which is I think really talking about synthetic nicotine here, uh, may be a golden ticket, no FDA regulation, no tobacco taxes, no flavor restrictions, and no restrictions on direct-to-consumer e-commerce. So you know, pointing out that it's not just FDA regulation, uh, but all sorts of other uh, laws and rules uh, that may have definitions in them. I wouldn't, they don't all, but they might um, have definitions in them that, that are focused on uh, nicotine being actually derived from tobacco plants uh, and that might not reach synthetic nicotine products. So what can be done about this regulatory gap? Um, what we wrote in that Boston College Law Review article is that the FDA could, under its existing authority, regulate synthetic nicotine as a drug delivery device. Uh, or regulate the nicotine as a drug, regulate products using it as drug delivery uh, devices. Um, you know, I won't go through the whole argument that we made, but you can look back at that argument or look back at that article if that's something that you're, uh, that you're interested in. Um, I would assume that the FDA has already been thinking about this for quite some time, but they have, have said nothing uh, publicly about it, and and now it's getting a little bit late in the game uh, for them to to try to do that. But you know what what we argued in the article is that you know, it should, if it were going to go this route, try to make the regulation on the drug side as similar as possible to the regulation on the tobacco side. So essentially, there's no benefit uh, from using uh, synthetic versus tobacco derived uh, products, and they should essentially be regulated in the same way. Uh, another potential fix would be to go to Congress. Uh, so Congress could redefine the FDA's tobacco-related regulatory authority to include uh, synthetic nicotine or, or any nicotine product regardless of source. Uh, Congress, as I noted, is, seems to be thinking about that. Uh, Cliff noted that there's the, the proposed nicotine tax in the Build Back Better Act. Uh, interestingly, the draft that is out there says that nicotine subject to the tax is, quote, any nicotine which has been extracted, concentrated, or synthesized. Uh, and synthetic nicotine is mentioned actually a couple of times in, in laying out exactly who that tax would apply to. So Congress is clearly thinking about synthetic nicotine, uh, but the 
getting into the weeds a little bit, the Build Back Better Act is a reconciliation bill, um, which means that it's harder to make regulatory changes in that bill that are not revenue related. Uh, so you can you can make changes for taxes. Uh, it's a little harder uh, to make the argument that you can change the regulatory authority. Uh, so it's unclear that that could be done as part of this act. Um, and it's you know it's not clear that otherwise Congress is going to put it high on its list uh, to to redefine the definitions in the Tobacco Control Act. Um, you know maybe it could be added into some other bill that is otherwise moving through Congress, but it, you know it's hard to see um, Congress making this a, a high priority. Um, if we are sort of stuck in the current situation uh, where synthetic nicotine and tobacco derived nicotine are regulated differently, then having testing that could identify what is synthetic nicotine and what isn't uh, becomes important. Uh, and you know, that's an area where, as I understand it, the, the FDA, the CDC have been looking into that, uh, but there's still work to be done there. Uh, my understanding is that it, it is feasible to test for the racemic mixture to see that you have a product that is you know, this, this racemic mixture, in which case it, it, it is almost certainly synthetic nicotine. But if you're talking about companies that have done that second step and now isolated the S nicotine, uh, then it is harder to determine whether that nicotine is synthetic or tobacco derived, especially as I said, on the tobacco side, um, that methods keep getting improved for taking the impurities out so that the tobacco looks much more like synthetic nicotine. So it, it is making it difficult for the testing to keep up uh, and be able to figure out what is synthetic and what, what is not. So state and local governments um, also need to be thinking about this issue as, as that industry publication mentioned, uh, there could be implications for all sorts of tobacco related laws. Um, licensing laws, taxing laws, flavor restrictions, smoke-free laws, tobacco 21 laws, et cetera. Um, some jurisdictions are clearly thinking about this and working on it. Just, just recently at the local level, Chicago amended the definition of tobacco products and its city code uh, for you know, licensing purposes and um, its flavor restrictions and, and uh, tobacco 21 is all you know, within this definition now. Uh, so you know, all it did was was add four words uh, to what was already there. So now instead of saying you know, products containing nicotine derived from tobacco, all of those laws cover products containing nicotine derived from tobacco or any other source. So that was their, their legislative fix. Um, Wyoming, interestingly, um, uh, passed a law last year. Um, and I have not talked to people in Wyoming, but but what what I can tell from from my look at it uh, is that you know its its law prior to last year did not have a definition of e-cigarettes in it. So when they revised the law to put in a definition of e-cigarettes, uh, they added synthetic nicotine uh, as as part of that. Uh, DC, the government of DC, just passed uh, its own flavor ban uh, just you know a month or so ago. It included synthetic nicotine. Uh, within that. So I think, you know, as of you know, this past year or so, states and localities that are passing new laws are identifying synthetic nicotine as an issue and making sure that it's covered. Uh, but it's more difficult to actually you know, generate the energy to go back through the laws that are already on the books uh, and uh, revise the definitions in there to, to make sure that synthetic nicotine is, is covered. And, you know, to the extent that that does not happen, um, Testing is again an important issue. So, um, you know, state at the state level, certainly at the local level, uh, there is not necessarily the capacity to do testing uh, of these products. So it, you know, it opens the door for companies to claim that they are using synthetic pr products and therefore don't have to pay taxes or are not subject to regulation, um, even when that might not actually be the case. So, so thinking about a way to address that uh, is important. I mean, one th one thing that states and localities could do. Um, I think the, the better thing to do is go back and just amend these definitions so that they cover synthetic nicotine. Uh, but short of that, they could also think about at least shifting the burden so that if a company is claiming that they're using the synthetic nicotine, it is the company that actually has to prove that as opposed to the, the government having to prove that that is not the case. So um, just final notes. Um, companies uh, are we're now seeing 
tobacco free claims uh, associated with a bunch of different types of products. And in many cases, those are not synthetic nicotine products. So companies are using the phrasing tobacco free to refer to products that use nicotine that has been derived from tobacco, but, but it's just the nicotine and not the rest of the tobacco plant. Um, so some companies are using it in that sense. Other companies are using it when they are talking about synthetic nicotine. So I think that just caused, actually I have it on, on my desk. I don't know if you can see this, but with my background, this is Zim, um, is, is one of those companies that's a, you know, a Swedish, Swedish match, uh, nicotine pouches. Um, you know, they, they say very prominently on this flyer that I have that it's tobacco free, but it, it is tobacco derived nicotine. Um, so I think that that is causing confusion for both regulators and consumers, uh, what that term actually means. Um, there's an interesting question and confusion about what companies are supposed to do when they're using this racemic mixture, uh, what, are, what they're supposed to do in terms of reporting the amount of nicotine that is in the product. Um, because if they report the total amount of, of nicotine, counting both the R nicotine and the S nicotine, the amount that's biologically active might just be half of that. So consumers might be expecting the product to have twice the effect uh, that it actually does. But of course, if they only report half of it, then they're not reporting something else that is technically actually nicotine. Um, so it's unclear what companies are even supposed to be doing in that case, but it is clear that it's gonna cause confusion again, both for regulators and consumers. Um, and so there is, you know, I think plenty of research that needs to be done on how these products are being used um, on their marketing, on consumer perceptions, on you know, potential health effects. Uh, on the testing itself. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in this issue and, um, and people are trying to catch up quickly, but I think you know, ultimately fixing this regulatory gap so that synthetic nicotine and tobacco derived nicotine are, are regulated the same way will, will address many of these issues. So I think finally, just to wrap this up, um, I, I think there are some people, you know, largely within the e-cigarette industry, but not just within the e-cigarette industry that have been kind of cheering on uh, the emergence of synthetic nicotine and its use to evade FDA and other regulations. And you know, I think the argument there is that the FDA is essentially doing a bad thing, making bad decisions in arguing, in, in ordering these products to be taken off the market, uh, that you know, these products are valuable for harm reduction and therefore figuring out a way to make sure that they are still available to consumers uh, is, is inherently a good thing. Uh, relatedly, I've, I've seen some arguments that are kind of in the, you know, we told you so vein um, that, that are arguing that, you know, when you try to prohibit things, this is inevitably what happens, that companies will figure out, um, you know, a way around that and that, you know, trying to keep products off of the market is just inherently uh, a bad idea. So, you know, I wanted to put those arguments out there. Um, I, you know, I would say that that whatever you think of the FDA's decisions, uh, treating identical or or close to identical products differently depending on the source of of the nicotine is is just irrational public policy. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's perfectly fine to have have disagreements with what the FDA has done and argue it, that it should be doing things uh, differently. Uh, but, you know, making policy by loophole, uh, I think is, is not a good approach and is, is not sustainable. So, you know, I hope this is something, um, as with many things related to the FDA, I think this is another issue that the FDA could have gotten out in front of, uh, instead of waiting for it to be a problem. Um, but I hope that, that it is something that it will address, uh, sooner than later. So I will, um, leave you with one of my favorite loophole related cartoons. Um, and I will uh, pass it over to, to Holly. <laughs> First of all, thanks, uh, thanks, Micah, and thanks for the for the light touch at the end. Uh, that's that's <laughs> wonderful. I'm uh, I'm going to try to incorporate that in more of my presentations. Um, you know, uh, we've received, by the way, a number of questions, and just to let folks know, we're going to do our best at the uh, toward the end of the webinar to address as many. Uh, of them as we can. So um, in addition, one question came in about whether slides would be shared and we will 
uh, attach those uh, to the recorded video when we uh, disseminate that in the next few days. So um, with that, um, Holly, I see that you'll need to uh, unmute yourself and uh, please go ahead. Thanks. Sorry about that, it would not share for a moment. There we go. So, hi, uh, I'm actually an associate professor in Nowcliffe, which is, I'm very pleased to report since September. Um, and so uh, I'm a political scientist by training, as Cliff said. And so my interest in some of these questions is around the political regulation, particularly how these regulatory systems affect markets in different places. And so when thinking about today's topic of uh, trying to regulate in conditions of uncertainty, I thought it would be very good to um, put a spotlight on a slightly different approach, which is definitely not regulating by loophole, um, but maybe poses its own challenges. Uh, and I wanted to, to show you um, a little bit of my thinking on the regulation of e-cigarettes in the UK, potentially as the medicinal devices. Um, and um, the, this is a very new development where I think thinking is um, pretty preliminary but because this announcement only came out in October, very end of October from uh, the UK's regulatory body, the MHRA. So I'm gonna talk a bit about this because I think the, there are also some connections here between how the UK will regulate its e-cigarette market and then the impact that may have potentially on global markets, uh, which will also affect uh, the US. So um, the UK's main agency, as I said, is the MHRA for this purpose. Um, it's the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. And it has a role both regulating medicines and regulating things like medical devices. So the key here is um, to hear that any e-cigarettes that are regulated as medicines in the UK will also be regulated uh, as medical devices, with the exception of um, devices that are disposable and not refillable. So um, new guidance came about in, in the end of October. Uh, which was explicitly in the guidance encouraging e-cigarette firms to apply for market authorization as medicines, um, which is, if you have been following policy in the UK, as I'm sure many people do, um, is a, in, in continuity with past policy. Uh, it's definitely a step further. Um, and it's quite an interesting step with some unanswered questions, which is why I think it's useful for this presentation. So. The MH, MHRA is a competent authority for both pre-market approval uh, of medicines, but also post-market surveillance and safety review. Um, and on the medical device side, that happens in conjunction with um, some uh, third party entities, which are called notified bodies, uh, who are, are delegated responsibility to make sure that uh, in potentially e-cigarette products would be safe and the batteries won't blow up in your face and that kind of thing. So um, there's continuity here between the uh, regulatory system under the EU and then the regulatory system now in the UK, and I'll get into that in a minute. The really interesting thing, though, is this paves the way, um, although it does not guarantee, um, availability of e-cigarettes via prescription that would be covered by the UK's national health services. And um, that's a pretty big deal because the UK NHS serves uh, a great number of people in the UK, almost everybody. Um, and I'll talk about why that's a big deal in a moment. Interestingly, also from an international perspective, this goes even a step beyond, um, to some extent, what's happening in Australia. Uh, so in Australia, also in October, uh, new laws came into effect. Um, and so now nicotine containing e-cigarettes are only available via prescription uh, in Australia. And the new law that came into effect in October uh, was actually sort of closing a loophole. So they were regulating to the loopholes um, for imports of nicotine containing e-cigarette products. 
So the, the thing here, though, is that the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia has not to date approved any product and takes great care on its website to say, we do not monitor the safety of these products. So if you want to obtain them, you need a prescription, but we are not the keepers of that process. So um, why is this a big deal in the UK? There's a couple of reasons. And I always like to remind American audiences that under the UK's health system, um, there's no copay or charge to see a physician, visit a clinic, or go to a hospital. So uh, instead, you pay a prescription charge for medicines, uh, which is £9.35 per item, which is about $12.50. Um, and one of the reasons this could have an effect on access and have an effect on use um, is actually this cost component. And so these prices might vary depending on whether or not you got a deal on whatever e-cigarette product you might try be trying to get. Um, but if you think about it, potentially it's in the, the ballpark where a prescription would be cheaper for somebody um, than an e-cigarette um, device and pods. So um, I think also it's important to, so, to say that the, the cost of a pack of 20 cigarettes, roughly 20, uh, 10 pounds 20, about 13.65. So the UK's national health services procure in bulk. Um, and so access to this market is potentially desirable, especially if it allows um, some of the changes that regulating e-cigarettes as a medicine might allow. Um, and prescription charges are capped for patients. For older patients, they're completely eliminated. Uh, and so uh, for over 65s, there are, there's no prescription charge. Um, there could also be a change in use. So um, the proponents of this policy change uh, are all over the press saying that up to one third of smokers in the UK haven't tried e-cigarettes. And there are some widespread opinions around um, the health and safety concerns of e-cigarettes. Some people um, think that they are just as, or, or if not more dangerous potentially. Um, and so e-cigarettes also, if they are approved as medicines, would not be subject to the same restrictions as commercial products. So the, the big draw here potentially for industry uh, manufacturers is that this would allow a higher concentration of nicotine in these products. Um, and so, Proponents, again, are point, pointing to evidence that these higher nicotine concentrations promote switching. Um, and it, so it is of a continuity with uh, the UK's trajectory over time towards, um, let's say, a more harm reductionist stance on e-cigarettes. Um, but I would say also um, the, it, it is essentially quite explicit guidance promoting uh, this new approach. So um, I want to correct one misconception, though. This is not really about new laws. Uh, if, if you read some of the industry press, there's a, um, a celebration of Brexit that says, well, now we're, we're no longer bound by the EU's terrible laws. Uh, we can have some, a better market for e-cigarettes in the UK. It's really not the case. Um, so the regulations of e-cigarettes in the UK is still based on essentially the EU laws that were transposed into UK law uh, before Brexit. Uh, this might change over time, however. There's no guarantee that necessarily the two countries are going to maintain uh, regulatory stick with each other. Um, although I would say in terms of keeping in step a regulatory divergence for commercial e-cigarettes could come with barriers uh, for the industry, you know, having to service two different markets with two different sets of standards. One key difference that might come into play later um, could be that the, the UK High Court is no longer the, um, within the EU's court system. Prior to Brexit, uh, the Court of Last Resort was really the Court of Justice of the European Union, and a number of tobacco cases made their way through the High Court, and then uh, the High Court would give reference to the CJEU. Um, so to some extent, the last resort now uh, outside of the EU is uh, international arbitration. I have to put that in there because of my interest in, in trade and investment law. So um, if we actually look at what the e-cigarette industry wanted from Brexit, 
Two, uh, they wanted snooze to be allowed. They wanted uh, definitely higher nicotine concentrations to be allowed. Um, they wanted to eliminate restrictions on tank sizes, allow advertising for e-cigarette products and reduce or eliminate warnings. Mostly in conjunction, uh, these all relate to restrictions that were placed on commercial e-cigarettes um, within EU, EU law that are uh, still there for uh, commercial e-cigarettes in UK law. So um, this to me is, uh, they, some of the industry discussion very much um, assumes that Brexit means a better market for them. This might not be the case, although we can, I think we'll talk about in a minute, why it, it also, this could be a prop, good proposition for some e-cigarette manufacturers to have their devices regulated as medicines. So um, the, there are some key points of interest in this new guidance, um, which I think are important for not just the UK, but for other countries that are considering um, some of these policy choices. So we're talking here about refillable and reusable e-cigarettes that um, the manufacturers intend to pair with some kind of claim around quitting. Um, so there's a health claim here. Uh, and they are regulated as medicines, but also as medical devices. Um, and the, the MHRA has uh, a role already in re regulating harm reduction products, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, so things like patches, gum, and inhalers. Um, so the inhaler that's pictured here is actually um, recommended in the guidance, named in the guidance as a great reference product to reference in um, a company's market application. So uh, the MHRA also does regulate commercial e-cigarettes and those may not make health claims. One of the really interesting things here is this is going to be a truncated authorization process, most likely. There are different pathways under the law um, and the generic and hybrid pathways uh, don't require clinical trial data, which is something that could be potentially um, very attractive to applicants. And um, the guidance states that because nicotine is not a new chemical entity, and I put that in quotes, given the topic uh, of Micah's talk today, um, the, the truncated application would be allowed because they could base the application on an existing reference product of which they have named, um, the, the MHRA, the agency has named Nicorette 15 milligram inhaler as uh, a very good reference product. Um, so to me, this is, is unusual. To, to name a product like this in guidance. Um, the whole tone of the guidance is very much along the lines of, of holding the industry's hand um, and very much expresses the intent of the government of the day to try and uh, encourage applications. So um, here, the key test when it comes to something like synthetic nicotine for products that would be regulated um, as medicines, would be um, a bioequivalence test. So uh, here the um, reference product has to be bioequivalent to the new product that's being authorized in order to um, come under this truncated process. Um, now there are two ways to do that. The generic process is the simplest, but if that bioequivalence isn't met, for example, because um, the new product is a higher strength product that has a higher concentration of nicotine, uh, the hybrid process would also allow a truncated application. So there's also though an advising process. So there's debate and discussion pre-application between MHRA and the firms who are applying. And one of the things that the guidance also explicitly mentions is um, the potential for products in the FDA's PMTA process to potentially submit some of the same data to MHRA. Um, and so I think this is very interesting because it is potentially having an effect on um, producers that want to market their product in the UK and elsewhere in the UK and the US simultaneously. And I think um, seeing how that gets used in practice over time, if um, 
ap um, applications are forthcoming. Uh, that would be an interesting thing to see um, what the effects are on the international market. So I think there are a number of open questions here that I want to talk about a little bit. And please do remember that I'm a political scientist. So a lot of what I care about is the regulatory politics of this. Now, um, I think one of the open questions, so this is the authorization process I've been talking about, but the NHS uh, also then has a procurement process. And it will be interesting to see how NHS procurement of e-cigarettes on a large scale potentially would affect e-cigarette markets. Now, as I said in the beginning of the talk, it is not guaranteed that the NHS um, would go through this process, uh, even if an application were approved, but that's the direction that the uh, government of the day would like to go in. So um, what kinds of uh, effects will that have on the cigarette market in general in the UK is I think an open question. Another question that I think is interesting in both the UK context and if in Australia a product were to be approved, it would also be of interest in the Australian context, is that guidance to physicians is a matter of policy. So even once um, there is uh, market approval for the product, then uh, there has been a policy decision to procure e-cigarettes and provide them to patients. That guidance to physicians around prescribing um, it would also be a matter of policy within the NHS in conjunction with discussions with uh, professional associations. So at the moment, I, we're too far ahead of that, but I would be interested in seeing what the guidance would be. Um, I think one thing that I haven't seen um, fully played out is what would happen to patterns of dual use. Um, and maybe some of that would come down to the um, shape of the market as well as the prescription costs. Um, I could imagine also a scenario where um, the MHRA doesn't approve any flavored products. You have a plain or tobacco flavored product uh, that you can get on prescription. But then what, what choices does that person make uh, in acquiring other products that potentially could be flavored, potentially could be more attractive? Would some of those products then be um, considered to be higher harm products such as flavored cigarettes or other products? Um, I also have a lot of questions because I, uh, one of the things I study uh, is um, actual med actually medical device regulation. Um, how well will the post-market surveillance work in the UK? So post-market surveillance of medical devices in the European Union, which was the system that it, it's still the system that the UK shares, although in parallel with EU law. Um, the, it relies a lot on third party bodies, which are by all means not very good. They're not very robust. Uh, they tend to actually go bust if they don't have enough capital. And these are the bodies that um, regulate medical devices, uh, particularly high risk medical devices. Um, and these e-cigarettes will most likely be classified as category two A or B, um, so medium to high risk medical devices. And so um, I worry a bit that the bodies that are supposed to ensure safety after these products reach the market are probably not equipped at the moment to deal with e-cigarettes. Um, and there might have to be quite a bit of learning there. Uh, and potentially some of these bodies um, in response to changes in EU law have actually gone bust and the data that they uh, were curating went bust with them. So that has caused huge problems over time for the EU. I wonder to what extent um, the MHRA would be able to do a better job managing these third party regulators. Um, another big question for me is how well will import controls work? Currently, um, the UK's trade policy is a bit of a mess because um, of Northern Ireland. The Northern Ireland protocol after Brexit was an agreement that uh, is currently managing uh, trade in Northern Ireland. And there's some um, overlapping regulatory regimes there. So these products, uh, e-cigarette products, if authorized as medicines and medical devices in the UK, will have to um, have a compliance mark which is the UK compliance mark, products in Northern Ireland will also have to comply by with EU standards and contain an EU compliance mark. 
and it is a very big mess, which if anyone wants to ask me about in questions, we can talk about more. It's pretty complicated. Um, but I worry a bit about the UK's governance ability to um, deal with import issues. Uh, and I can imagine a lot of people may choose to try to import some of these products. So um, I already alluded to the question of to what position will MHRA take on flavoured products? Um, over time, I wonder whether um, this would pave the way for more regulatory changes that the e-cigarette industry would like to see. The things that um, they put in that, that prior list I showed you, such as um, for, for commercial products, such as um, changes in nicotine concentration um, and changes in tank size, for example. Uh, and they would very much like to see differences, a, a different regime for, for advertising and promotion of products. I wonder at what point, um, whether this would strengthen some of their arguments about uh, changing the regulations of those commercial products. Okay, so we've got a lot of open questions, I think, to be worked out on the detailed regulatory side. Um, if this could be a big potential change, um, it's, like I said, in continuity with the UK's policy position over time, but it is another step um, down the harm reduction path, for want of a better term, for the UK, um, and it will be very interesting to see how this impacts the decisions made in other countries over time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, if you ever want to email me after this presentation, happy to chat with all of you. Looking forward to your questions. Wonderful. Uh, Holly, thank you. Thank you uh, as well, Micah. This this has been as, uh, I don't know if it's the right word, as fulsome a discussion of these issues as I think is possible. Um, you've covered uh, not only the broad stroke areas, but really a number of the intricacies here. And so for all of the nerds who are attending today, the geeks around these issues, they've got to be thrilled. I know I am. So I, I really do uh, appreciate that. And thanks for leaving some ample time for some good Q&A. We have received a number of uh, questions, a couple of comments. Uh, they're, they're very interesting. I, I think the first one, uh, maybe to Micah, which is um, uh, how clean is Nordic air? <laughs> I have no idea. I've never so, uh, been there. You know, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not really sure either. Um, let me let me turn to a couple of uh, more detailed questions, and we'll deal with Nordic Air uh, later. Um, one interesting question is how marketable uh, would a product be if it did not make or hint at health claims? Um, the examples, Micah, that you showed had at least one with a clear health claim that FDA could uh, conceivably object to. Do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's the regulatory question. I mean, so products that have health claims would provide one basis for the FDA regulating these products. It, what the article that the, the Boston College uh, Law Review article that, that we wrote lays out the argument for regulating these products as drugs, regardless of health claims. I don't think it's necessary for, for FDA regulation. I, I think probably a lot of people on this call know the history that the FDA tried to regulate um, tobacco products as under its drug and device authority back in the 90s under the argument that, um, that nicotine was a drug and therefore tobacco products were drug delivery devices. And that, that did not work, but it, it did not work because of the sort of unique history of, of tobacco regulation. So I think all of that would be largely inapplicable to synthetic nicotine. Uh, and the FDA would have, a, I think, a very strong basis for arguing that, that synthetic nicotine is a drug um, that it can regulate under that authority. So then, you know, how, how marketable are these products without those claims? How much of a difference are those claims making? Um, I, I, I think those are good empirical questions um, that I don't, uh, have answers to how how persuasive these products uh, or these claims are to people, and and, uh, and there's some new research that just came out recently suggesting that that they probably are making these products uh, somewhat more appealing. But I, I think there's a lot more work to be done on this. I think ultimately, 
synthetic nicotine is going to win over tobacco derived nicotine on price. Um, that that's going to be what is going to drive once the price actually once those lines cross and the price for synthetic nicotine drops under uh, the the price for tobacco derived nicotine, then it makes sense for companies to use that um, and. And I, I, you know, I saw one of the comments hinting at this um, that you know that could, could well be the future of of nicotine if if the technology and production um, gets to a point where it, it is cheaper to produce than the than the tobacco dry version. I think it's probably the more important effect. Interesting observations. I I understand that the the cost of producing synthetic nicotine has come down, although still quite a bit more than uh, tobacco derived nicotine, but has come down pretty substantially and is doing so pretty quickly. Um, so an interesting question came in. You know, early in your presentation, Micah, you uh, included a slide that showed an image from a recent article from Filter uh, and from Alex Norcia. Turns out that uh, Alex Norcia, the reporter, is here today and has posed a question. So um, he's indicated uh, the following. I've spoken to Ron Tully, a co-founder at Next Generation Labs, who received one of those letters, uh, interrogatory letters from Representative Krishnamurthy. He repeatedly makes the claim that synthetic nicotine is a technology and would reduce the carbon footprint of tobacco. Of course, that comes with a host of problems. Obviously, the evolution of synthetic nicotine could put people out of work in the United States, et cetera, and potentially tank the economies of entire nations like Malawi, a high tobacco producer. But I'm curious what you all think about that argument. He seems just steps away from claiming synthetic nicotine can help save the planet and shouldn't be regulated out of existence. So to, to either or both of you. Yeah, so first of all, and thanks Alex for your reporting uh, on, on this topic. I know he's he's been out ahead of this, uh, ahead of other publications on, on recognizing this as an issue and, and reporting on it. So I, I appreciate that work. You know, I, I think those are, those are arguments that I would not dismiss um, out of hand. I mean, tobacco production is, causes a lot of problems. Holly's probably studied this more than most people, um, but you know it's associated with all sorts of environmental problems and child labor problems and other problems. And um, I mean, there might, as as is hinted there, there might be distributional effects of of you know eliminating the tobacco production side. But I think you know, assuming those distributional effects could be dealt with, it is probably a very good thing for the planet um, to to move away from from tobacco production if if synthetic nicotine can do it. So I, I my my argument here was not to suggest that that synthetic nicotine should be regulated out of existence. The argument is that it should be regulated, you know, essentially the same way uh, as other uh, as other nicotine products are, and be allowed to compete on on a fair basis with with those other products. I mean, if it ultimately, and I, I think there are are also unanswered questions, as, as I suggested, uh, that, that we need to dive into deeper before we sort of put all of our eggs in the synthetic nicotine basket. I think there are. You know concerns about byproducts, and, and one other thing I didn't mention is you know we just don't know in terms of the interaction between S nicotine and R nicotine what that does uh, in the body. It just has not been studied. So you know I think there are unanswered questions we want to get into first, but uh, I think those those are good points um, to be made and to be kept in mind going forward. Yeah, and if I can add from a political economy perspective, um, you know that there's. There are provisions in the FCTC that address this. Uh, unfortunately, they're relatively weak and, and relatively not implemented. But the it is a recognized problem around which there is a political consensus that there does need to be investment to move countries away from dependence on tobacco. That doesn't necessarily equate to um, synthetic nicotine will be amazingly successful and save the planet. But I think there is a sound argument that we should try to uh, where possible, encourage countries to diversify, not just for tobacco, relying on any single product as a majority of your economy is not a great plan, uh, but because there is also issues here with child labor, as Micah said, uh, environmental concerns, um, but this needs a lot, not just political consensus, but a lot of investment uh, and support for those countries to actually move uh, and diversify 
the, the manufacturing base. Micah, any follow-up to that? No, I just I want to make sure, <laughs> make sure we have the opportunity. I agree. Okay, that's a good one. Um, another question came in um, where it says, Holly, you asked in, in a question that you post on one of your slides, will MHRA authorize flavored products? Interesting question. And the question is here, wouldn't it make sense for them to be authorized uh, in settings where clinicians are providing perhaps expert guidance? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it would depend then upon the guidance. And I think it would also depend on the evidence for um, the effectiveness of the flavored product, right? Um, now, I think it might make sense from a policy point of view uh, to authorize flavored products uh, as well, because what you're trying to do, if your goal indeed is to promote switching, promote uh, use, of these products and the flavored products that we know are sometimes more attractive to people. I think, um, you know, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot a little bit if you've just got tobacco flavored products and then commercially available products which are not regulated in the same way or to the same standards uh, include flavored products. Um, and I think the physician guidance part though, we can provide guidance to physicians. We all know that physicians don't necessarily follow the guidance per se, um, and they have their own approach to prescribing. Um, and also that doesn't necessarily um, affect individual behavior. People can go out and, and purchase these products anyway. Um, it might make sense to make available something which they might find more attractive um, via a prescription. Mm -hmm. So uh, one other, you've been addressing the issue of synthetic nicotine and both of you have. Um, at a, at a broad level with some real detail. A question did come in, what are the best and worst case scenarios as you see it in terms of how Congress might address the issue of synthetic nicotine now? And they are in discussions with FDA, um, Center for Tobacco Products Director Mitch Seller has indicated that much. Um, what are your thoughts around that? I mean, I think probably at this point, what I mean, if you're going to go back and start FDA regulation over, I might have different thoughts about it. But I mean, I think at this point, um, making it so that that you know recreational nicotine products are are regulated the same, regardless of the source of nicotine, um, is probably the most sensible way to do it. Uh, you know, as I said, getting Congress to you know that that is a change that Congress would have to make, um, unless. Uh, the the other route, as I said, would would be for the FDA to do it itself, but it, it is more it would be more a little more complicated to do it. So the easiest thing would be for Congress to fix it, but but doing that is is difficult. And you know, I know the the main public health groups are always um, very reticent to ask Congress to do anything because once you open up the act and start making changes, um, other changes can be put in uh, through that process that. That, that might be more problematic. So I'm definitely, I, I think that, you know, in terms of you know, what makes logical sense uh, for a regulatory scheme, that that's probably the best case scenario, but, you know, I also think it's, it's probably not super likely um, at, at this point. So, I mean, I think the worst case scenario is sort of where we are now, um, which is just ignoring it as a problem as it gets to be a bigger and bigger problem. Uh, and it, you know, it does become an issue for FDA legitimacy. If it's saying that these products uh, have to come off the market and these products, you know, these companies are, you know, essentially not, not to imply that they're doing anything illegal because I don't think they are, but, you know, they're essentially thumbing their noses at, at the FDA uh, and saying, no, we're going to keep, keep selling these, these products. Um, you know, that, that becomes more and more of a problem for, for the legitimacy of the whole FDA regulatory scheme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like Michael, I think you're even alluding to like the mischaracterization of the problem by the FDA is a credibility issue, mm -hmm. um, which is a problem. It's not just ignoring the problem. It's, it's, it's not even sweeping it under the carpet. It's mischaracterizing what the issue is. And so I think that 
can undermine trust in the agency. When, as a political scientist, when I hear the word legislation lately, I, I do a, have a bit of a sigh, um, trying to get every, anything through of any kind, like we're reliant on omnibus bills and sort of must pass legislation right now. So I can't see it as a very feasible route. And even if it were a very feasible route, would it be desirable? Not necessarily. We would love the kind of political process, uh, legislative process that we're supposed to have that we get taught about in school where it's uh, carefully deliberated, but I'm not sure that would be the case. Um, I would say in the EU too, where they um, they tried to, uh, when they, they last revived their tobacco products directive, uh, it was the parliament where lobbying happened and um, things were, uh, fundamental changes were made that were um, what the industry wanted to see. So. Uh, I would love to be able to say, yes, dem democratically speaking, legislation should be the way, but um, feasibly, uh, it's probably not a good idea right now. So let's shift gears for a moment. We may well come back to uh, synthetic nicotine. But one question came in, actually uh, uh, directed to you, Holly, but I think it, it can equally be directed to both of you. Uh, but it's framed this way, as a political scientist, what are your viewpoints on policies being considered in the US and in New Zealand, such as reducing nicotine levels in cigarettes to non-addictive levels and enabling availability and encouraging the use of alternative, safer nicotine devices to adult smokers who cannot completely quit uh, tobacco slash nicotine use. This is technologically feasible, it seems, but societal, slash political problems seem to be slowing it down. Do, do you have some thoughts on that? I have some thoughts. I, I think um, when a policymaker hears this, they hear litigation um, and they maybe are a little worried about that. Uh, it's the kind of thing where I'm not sure it's political opposition so much as it's the kind of idea that needs good framing in order to get political will behind it to actually push something like this forward. I think it's the kind of policy that sounds, even though it's not outlandish and it's technically feasible, it might sound outlandish to a policymaker. And so I think the politics of this rest on the framing and how you might try to, to sell and justify it. Uh, to uh, someone who's making a policy decision, really. Micah, I know that you've yeah. looked a lot at the issue of nicotine reduction and in including the arguments industry might make in, in any follow-up litigation in that area, et cetera. What, are, what do you think? Yeah, so, so first of all, um, and I probably should have mentioned this in my presentation, I mean, that, that's an even more obvious case where the FDA would have to get its hands around synthetic nicotine because if, if it doesn't, that you know that that whole regulatory scheme could easily be evaded. So you know any attempt to require reduction of nicotine levels would have to apply equally to to tobacco derived and synthetic nicotine, or the, or the whole effort would be fairly pointless. So I, I think that that's important. Um, I mean, in terms of uh, the likelihood of this happening, I'm I'm more optimistic on behalf of New Zealand um, than than. Uh, on behalf of of the U.S., I mean, I I I think you know, as as the question states, it is technologically feasible. I think as a policy matter, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but you know, the the political context is just is just difficult, and I mean, we've seen the FDA really struggle to do, I would say, much of anything um, over the course of the time that it's been regulating tobacco products. Um, and you know, if you look at the FDA right now, the FDA doesn't even have a permanent commissioner um, right now. It still has an acting commissioner. Um, it's not going to make major policy decisions like that in in the context where it just has an acting um, commissioner. It is still obviously swamped with dealing with COVID. Um, it does not want to take on. Uh, I would imagine does not want to take on something this big while well, it's still trying to deal with with all of that. Um, it is already getting a flood of litigation over the, the PMTAs that it has denied already, and it's going to get more as it continues to do that. So to Holly's point, um, raising the specter of litigation, it does seem to be something that the FDA has been very concerned about 
uh, all of this time. And you know, I think as 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 you said, we we wrote an article suggesting that the FDA would would have you know very strong legal basis for moving forward with such a rule, but but there absolutely would be litigation over it. Um, you saw with the you know the graphic warnings, the most recent round of graphic warnings litigation. You know, not only did the industry sue, but it, it went to the Fifth Circuit to find the most favorable courts that it could um, in the country. So, you know, it, it, it is being more strategic even about its litigation and would certainly continue to do that. So I, I just think, you know, again, I, I absolutely agree with it as a as a policy measure, um, but but the obstacles are, are pretty immense. I think it would really, really help to change the public conversation if another country went first um, and showed that it was, was feasible um, and could work. Um, so I, I think, unfortunately, in the US context, we're probably gonna have to wait for that to happen. Any, any prognoses out there on what we might expect to happen in New, in New Zealand? Do you think they're gonna succeed in pursuing this policy? They, I mean, they, they have not only proposed this policy, they have proposed like your kind of wish list of all of the tobacco control policies at the same time. So uh, I, I think, you know, from, from what I understand, um, you know, they've, they have a health ministry that is very supportive and they are going to do something, um, you know, whether, whether the nicotine reduction piece is the part that gets cut out um, when they are, are moving to the final product, uh, that, that I don't know. Uh, always dangerous to try to read tobacco leaves. So um, let's switch gears for just a moment. This, this isn't actually something that uh, the two of you spent time on, but it does plug in certain respects nicely into this broader discussion. Um, there is the current proposal to raise tobacco taxes in Congress. Um, it would raise taxes on e-cigarettes, vaping liquids, and oral nicotine pouches to parity with or even higher than the existing tax on cigarettes, but at this point not raise the cigarette tax at all. An earlier version since dropped would have doubled the cigarette excise tax to $2.01 per pack, which would be the first increase in 12 years, saving more lives and raising substantially uh, more revenue. As stated in a Wall Street Journal headline yesterday, this has, quote, sparked concerns that people will go back to cigarettes, close quote, because it would, quote, eliminate the price differential that makes vaping a more attractive option financially, close quote. Your thoughts, please. Does the body language say it? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sad, yes. Uh, so given what we do know about harms from these different kinds of products, they think it, it you know, the priority should be raising tax on cigarettes. We have strong evidence of harm. Um, we want to discourage people from using them. I'm not surprised. Hopefully the body language conveyed that. Um, but I, I still am a bit dismayed by this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm very curious to, I, now that I know we have reporters on the line, I'm, I'm very curious to, to see like what who was who responsible for that change and the the increase in the cigarette tax being um, pulled out of there because I have not seen um, any any reporting on that um, so I mean I, I think um, I mean the Wall Street Journal headline framing I mean as, as that suggests I mean I think it gets into a much more fundamental debate about you know, what people think about e-cigarettes and, and their potential and what they are doing that, that we probably don't have time to um, to fully uh, rehash here. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, to, um, you know, I, I agree that, that um, the priority should be on reducing combustible tobacco use um, and that that is where you're going to have the biggest um, public health uh, impact. And, I, you know, I think, um, yeah, I can see both sides of the argument for for the tax parity, so I don't want to to you know get into that too extensively. But I you know I think ultimately bigger picture wise, uh, there really has to be more of a focus put on the combustible tobacco side and reducing um, combustible tobacco use. And um, you know I think. 
probably far too much energy and time got spent on on focusing on the the e-cigarette side while while giving essentially a pass on the the combustible tobacco side. Uh, some pretty profound observations. Um, very very big issues here. Um, I don't know how closely. The two of you may be following the intricacies of the politics on Capitol Hill. You probably are. A number of uh, us are, including, including I'm sure people who are in attendance. Uh, but it is difficult to uh, engage in, in in real knowledgeable prognostication about what may happen on the Hill um, if this uh, leaves the House of Representatives and makes it to the Senate with with all of the challenges incumbent there that that I think folks are, are well aware of involving. Uh, politics and and uh, how the the build back better and reconciliation plan may go. So the tobacco tax issue ends up being wrapped up in the middle of a very complex uh, world. And and uh, and you're right, Michael. You know, and we'll see how it goes. Um, so let me give you a, a much more um, mundane but actually quite important question. I'm just shifting back for a moment to synthetic nicotine. Someone asked a basic scientific question, is it known yet what the effect is of synthetic nicotine on the developing brain up to age 25 years? And I think this is a reference to the discussion, scientific di discussion and discussion in the advocacy arena about the impact of nicotine exposure on, on young people. Yeah, so I mean, presumably if you're talking about the S nicotine, um, you know, it should be, I mean, it is chemically equivalent to the nicotine that is found in tobacco products and should have exactly the same effects. So you know, I, I did sort of gloss over it, but but did not mean to suggest that nicotine is harmless. Um, there, there, you know, there are harms associated with nicotine, particularly for, you know, adolescents and developing adolescents. And, and I mean, I, as I kind of <laughs> skipped over the previous question too, but I mean, the, the argument for the tax um, would be, you know, to the extent you're focused on the, on the youth uh, side of use, um, you know, taxes can be a very effective mechanism for reducing youth use as well. So um, you know, there, I think there's an argument for at least having some tax um, to increase the, the price of, of, of these products. So yeah, I mean, I, I think we need a lot more research, but I mean, nicotine, you know, at least the S nicotine, the nicotine is nicotine, um, and it, it, it should have pretty much the same biological effects as, as tobacco-derived nicotine does. Thanks, Holly. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? I think I agree with Micah. Um, so in terms of the tax question, we're talking about uh, the relative taxation on each product um, doesn't necessarily mean that we should not tax these cigarettes. There might be very good reasons to try to do that to prevent some people getting access. That said, the determinants of youth access are not just about price. Um, so I think that we need to be careful around that one. But yeah, I, I agree. I think, uh, although this is not my area of expertise, I'm more on the regulatory side, uh, that this is likely to be an equivalent effect. Thanks. Well, there is a regulatory question that came in and either of you may have thoughts around it. Micah, of course, you spent uh, time with FDA. Uh, so here's the question. It has been reported. Uh, in fact, I think this may have uh, uh, been reported by uh, Alex Norcia once again. It has been reported that the FDA's reviewers in the PMTA process created what may be a new method to get through millions of applications, a so-called fatal flaw analysis that involves searching applications for longitudinal cohort studies and randomized controlled trials or RCTs before evaluating other evidence. If an application lacks those types of supporting evidence, the reviewers don't advance it for more detailed review under the appropriate for the protection of public health standard and the application more or less automatically receives a marketing denied order or MDO at that point, excuse me, at that point. The FDA is currently facing dozens of legal challenges involving this and other details of the process. You are both, uh, let's see, so you're a lawyer, um, independent of the agency. Uh, you, Micah, Holly is a political scientist, independent of the agency. What are your thoughts on the appropriateness or fairness of the process based on what we know thus far 
and how it could potentially be improved? I hope I did that question justice. So I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll answer with the caveat that I'm not fully up to date on on all of this, and I have not looked at the the complaints in the litigation that is that has been filed so far. Uh, I mean, my my basic um, point uh, would be that I mean, in my view, that that would seem to me to be an appropriate action by the FDA, especially when facing millions of applications, to look for what is required to be in those applications. Uh, and if you know, important pieces of those applications are not there, uh, to not you know, essentially waste its time um, with reviewing the, the applications of, if it has already made clear that these are required components of, of the application. So I think the if there is important and that, that might be the basis um, for, for the litigation. So you know, if, if it has been very clear that these pieces need to be in there and the applications do not have those pieces, it seems to me appropriate that the FDA could you know, start there um, and um, you know, triage its decision making more effectively by not spending more time on applications that you know under its own framework are now are never um, actually going to be approved. So that that seems totally reasonable. My you know criticism of the FDA through this entire process is that it, it has probably been less than clear um, about what are uh, the requirements for for the applications and what are the metrics it is using for making its decisions about whether or not something is appropriate for the protection of public health. So you know, I'd have to look more closely at the the litigation to see um, you know, what 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 the claim is and you know in relation to what the FDA had said that it was going to require for these um, these applications, but that, that at least would be my my basic way of thinking through it. Yeah, I think I agree with you. And then my political science point that I would add is um, does the FDA have the regulatory capacity, the resources to hand to actually effectively conduct its task? Uh, is another question. I think there are a lot of government agencies where there's not enough workforce um, and trained staff. And uh, in some places, although I have no view window into the FDA uh, reliance on uh, junior staff or, or others to do some of this work. So I think there's a general question. As a general question, we should consider whether the FDA has the resources to hand to do this properly and well. Uh, thank you. Um, this has been a very robust discussion and, and remarkably, at least for me, time has flown and it looks like we are now down to the last minute or so. So um, in the interest of staying on time, uh, first of all, I want to thank both of our speakers, Holly Jarman and Micah Berman, uh, for uh, lending your valuable time to all of us today. Um, providing an extraordinary uh, level of expertise and providing such thoughtful uh, responses to, to a wide variety of, and, and I thank the audience for this very good and interesting questions. Um, let me remind folks that, again, the recording of this webinar and the slides, uh, thank you again to the speakers, will be made available in the next few days. Uh, again, we invite you to find your way uh, to the website of the University of Michigan Tobacco Research Network. Um, you can also visit the U of M Tobacco Research Network uh, on Twitter. And uh, uh, for those who are associated with the University of Michigan uh, or may have an interest and would like to explore it with us, we invite you to get in touch with us um, about receiving our regular uh, information and bulletins via uh, our listserv, uh, et cetera. So uh, let me uh, end by, again, offering up my email address in case there is any follow-up that anyone here uh, or sees this in the future would like to get in touch with us about. My email is cdoug at umich edu. So uh, again, uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. And we'll look forward to uh, all that's going to come on the issues that you've been discussing. So thanks and have a good afternoon. Thank you.